Hi, my name is Phil Jarrett, and I've written a lot of stories about surfers and surfing over the years. Some of them, some of them have been books, others have been magazine articles, and a couple have even been filmed. But there's one story that's always intrigued me, and until now, it's never really been fully told. To be honest, it's not even really a surf story. It's got more to do with manners, morals, love, loyalty, and the birth of leisure on the eve of the war to end all wars than it has to do with the act of riding waves. A century ago, a young Sydney schoolgirl goes to the beach near her home and she sees a tall, dark, handsome stranger carry a plank of wood down to the water and paddle it out into the churning waves. Then, wonder of wonders, he turns around and launches the plank and himself onto a huge wave and rides it majestically to shore. Within a couple of weeks, 15-year-old Isabel Leatham is riding to shore in the arms of the world's most exotic athlete the full-blood Hawaiian swimming and surfing champion, Duke Kahanamoku, in front of huge crowds of disbelieving onlookers. Her life will never be the same. When the fun-loving, ukulele-strumming Waikiki Beach Boy arrived in Australia, the beach was still, to many people, a daunting place where only a handful of years earlier, surf bathing had been punishable by law. But after his, after his visit, surfing became a national obsession. Unfortunately, though, many of those that Duke introduced to wave riding would never return from the shores of Gallipoli or the fields of France. This, I think, is the poignancy of my new book, That Summer at Boomerang. A hundred years ago, over here at Garden Island Docks, ships were loading up with men to go and fight the Great War in Europe. But most of Sydney was far more interested in what was about to happen right down here at the Domain Baths, Sydney's first harbourside swimming enclosure. The shadows of war might have loomed large over Sydney and over Australia as a whole, but uh, right here in Sydney on, on a beautiful summer morning, preparations were underway for the greatest sporting event that this city had seen, at least since Jack Johnson punched Tommy Burns to a pulp just over there at the stadium at Rushcutters Bay uh, one Boxing Day morning uh, to become the first black man to win the world title belt. Now, in the summer of 1914, the world and Olympic swimming champion, the most exotic athlete in the world, the full-blood Hawaiian, Duke Kahanamoku, was coming to town to swim right here. Not in the modern Boy Charlton pool, but in what used to be here on this site, the old Domain Baths, right in Sydney Harbour. Although he had become famous as the world's fastest swimmer over 100 yards when he beat Australia's Cecil Healy at the 1912 Stockholm Olympics, back home in Honolulu, Duke was just as well known as a surfer, one of the happy-go-lucky Waikiki Beach Boys who just happened to be the best exponent of the ancient art of board riding that the Hawaiians had ever seen. Outlawed for nearly a century because the missionaries believed that surfing, like dancing, could lead to sex, surfboard riding began to make a comeback in the early 1900s, with promoter Alexander Hume Ford establishing the Outrigger Canoe and Surfboard Club on the beach at Waikiki best-selling author Jack London publicising his attempts to master the sport in magazines around the world and with the regal, handsome, athletic Duke Kahanamoku as a sports icon. When Duke arrived in Sydney in mid-December, he and his teammate George Kuna, also Hawaiian, and their, their manager Francis Evans were given a civic reception over at the Hotel Australia, the plushest place in town. And uh, for about a week, they were taken around meeting dignitaries and they spent far more time shaking hands than they spent swimming laps of the pool. The whole time he was in the city wearing an ill-fitting suit, right here is where Duke Kahanamoku wanted to be. Surf shooting and surf swimming were very new to Australia. Just a dozen years earlier, daylight bathing in the ocean was banned for fear of the sight of someone in sluggos offending the sensibilities of a matron walking her dog along the shore. But in the years leading up to the Great War, the new federation had started to discover something called fun. Sexy vaudeville shows were in the theatres, Charlie Chaplin was on at the flicks, and here at Freshwater, just around the corner from the genteel bathing resort of Manly, the idea of a beach culture was beginning to take hold. Established in 1907, Freshwater Surf Club was one of the first in Australia, and not only did it make the beach a lot safer, there have been a lot of drownings here and over the other side of the cliff at Manly, but it be quickly became the hub of the community. 
it was kind of the meeting place for, uh, for all the people who lived up the back here in little, little shanties and shacks because this was really a working man's paradise, you know, and, I, and I, I mean man's paradise, women allowed only on Sundays. You know, there were, the amenities were, were uh, pretty ordinary here, but what a beautiful little bay it was in those days. The rich folk had their ritzy hotels just around the corner at Manly, but this was really working man's paradise. This is Lewis Tunnel. It goes from Queenscliff all the way through only, only about 20, 30 metres actually, through to the other side. Lewis, uh, Lewis built it uh, after he built the, um, the kiosk, Lewis Kiosk, and he built it uh, to encourage people to come over from Manly. It seemed to him it was a lot quicker and a lot easier for them to uh, just clamber around the rocks, go straight through, and, uh, and then clamber around the rocks on the other side to get to Freshwater Beach. The only other way to get to Freshwater before the trams came was to come up over the hill, and it was a hell of a climb. A lot of people weren't prepared to do that, they would stay at Manly. So he figured this is a good way to draw business. So if, you've got, if you're not scared of tunnels or the dark, follow me and we'll, we'll go the quick way to Freshwater Beach. Okay, here we are, freshwater, or almost. You've still got to clamber around these rocks, but uh, I don't think I'll be doing that this afternoon. A few days before Christmas 1914, Duke came out here to stay at Boomerang, which was uh, a camp just up here on the hill, uh, about 200, 200, 300 metres back from the beach. Uh, these days it's pretty much a suburban intersection, but, uh, but way back then, a sandy track led through the bush to the beach and it was really a very nice part of the world. And uh, Duke was the guest of Don McIntyre, who uh, owned Boomerang with a partner, and uh, he was the, uh, the pint-sized secretary of the New South Wales Sea Bathing Association. And uh, he was a funny little guy who ran Boomerang camp with an iron fist. This is the board that Duke made at Boomerang a century ago, or at least it's one of them. It's quite possible that he made two and the other one is down at Cronulla where he also gave an exhibition that summer. But this thing is eight foot eight inches long. It's, uh, it's beautiful sugar pine and uh, he, he got it from George Hudson Timber just up the road at Brookvale. Um, it's, it's a beautifully handcrafted surfboard, but I gotta tell you, it is very, very heavy. I can barely lift it. We see photos of Duke uh, just throwing it on his shoulder and carting it down to the surf, but uh, I can barely lift it off this sawhorse. You know, it is one heavy mother. It seems quite likely that Duke, being a surfer, would have shaped this thing and then brought it straight down here to try it out. You know, that's what most surfers do. Um, however, there's no record of that. Uh, we've got a surmise that that's what he did. And if he had uh, surfed freshwater in that first week before Christmas in, two, in, in 19, 1914, uh, then he would have met Claude West and Isabel Leatham, two of the young kids from around here uh, who weren't surfboard riders yet, but were great surf, surf shooters, body shooters. And, uh, Duke uh, was in the mid middle of a, a little battle between uh, the people who wanted to put the surfing exhibition on and the New South Wales Swimming Association because the Swimming Association felt that any kind of uh, demonstration by Duke pre their carnivals was going to hurt their ticket sales. So they really tried to stop him from doing it. And, and in fact, uh, on Christmas Eve, the demonstration was put on for members of the media only. But hidden away in the sandhills watching from a distance was Claude West and Isabel Leatham, and they both became his little acolytes that summer. Duke won every time he swam here when he swam off scratch. You know, sometimes they'd put an incredible handicap on him and he would still win or he would come second or third and he'd have the crowd absolutely standing up and hooting for him. It was, we had no one to match him. He was just the greatest swimmer that Australia and the world had ever seen. And nothing fazed him. You know, Duke just kept, kept smiling wherever he was. He'd pull out his ukulele at parties and play all night. And he was just the happiest, most wonderful uh, ambassador for the spirit of aloha. The Hawaiians were just loved everywhere they went. And they went a lot of places in Australia, from Rockhampton in the north, down to Melbourne in the south, and a lot of one-horse towns in between. And wherever he went, he was fated, and he, he gave as much as he got. Um, he was a truly well-loved figure by the time he left Australia. Nothing fazed Duke. Well, well, except for one thing. Here he was, right in the middle of a big city, 
and all he wanted to do was get out to the beach and go surfing. On Sunday, January 10, 1915, the day after the last Sydney carnival, Duke was back out at Boomerang and on that day, in front of a huge crowd at Freshwater, he really showed what could be done on a surfboard. Getting some big waves from the, uh, from the northern corner right down through the middle of the beach. He actually turned the board along the wave and then rode its green face. And that was something that had never been seen in Australia before. But he hadn't quite finished yet. He took a wave right to the beach and he put his board down and ran up through the crowd and uh, plucked from the crowd the young Isabel Lethem. Now, a lot of people think it was an impromptu, uh, an impromptu deal. I kind of have my doubts. I think, it, you know, Duke was first and foremost a showman. He was a showman at the pool and he was a showman at the beach. It's what he did. It's what he'd done for a very long time in Waikiki. And uh, I, I think it's quite, quite logical that uh, he, would have, he would have planted Isabel in the crowd and she was fully briefed and ready, uh, ready to take his hand and, uh, and, and go out there and surf with him. But what, ha what actually happened next, he took her out the, out the back, took off on a very big set wave and she was screaming, no, 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 to which Duke replied, yes, yes, yes. And they took off down the face and he lifted her up in front of him and then put her on his shoulders. And the crowd just went absolutely berserk. So whether Duke and Isabel had actually rehearsed that uh, tandem ride doesn't really matter. You know, either, either way, it was, a, it was the, the most uh, exciting exhibition of surfing that had ever been seen in Australia. And it certainly changed Isabel's life forever. I was scared stiff and he pulled back on the wave. I did this two or three times and he got sick of that. And the next time I did it, he said, oh yes, yes, yes. And we got on this big wave and uh, went right in that after that I was right. Duke rode tandem with Isabel in public just one more time. It was early in February after he got back from his Queensland tour and it was the occasion of the second annual DY Carnival. The surf was big and treacherous, a little bit like today's conditions and uh, Isabel later in life described it as a watery hell out there. Isabel's mother Jeannie came along and she pleaded with Duke not to take her out there but he said in his breezy beach boy way Oh, I'll catch a couple of waves, see how it is. If it's okay, I'll come and get her. Only if it's okay, Mom. Well, of course he came and got her. And of course they caused a sensation when they rode a giant wave together all the way to the beach. Cecil Healy was a real bloke's bloke, and he was none too impressed when Duke came and picked up Isabel. He later wrote in The Referee, It occurred to me that if Duke found it difficult to get going by himself for the waves at his disposal his chances of doing so would be greatly minimised when hindered by a novice. But even old Cess came around when they took off on the monster wave. It must be admitted, he admitted, that when it did come off, it was a sensational spectacle. When Duke left Sydney, the board stayed, and for a long time it was shared between Claude West and Isabel Lethem until they both got boards of their own. After that, it just kind of hung around the surf club and it was used by people. Claude would occasionally take it out for a spin at the front, um, and then many, many years later, uh, another great surfer, Snow McAllister, uh, used to take it out and surf it uh, up and down the coast. In fact, uh, it, 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 it miraculously appeared at the 1966 Australian Championships at Coolangatta, and that was probably the furthest it ever got away from home. But it ended up uh, safely back here. Claude eventually donated the board to the Freshwater Club, and it's been here ever since. It's been restored a couple of times. It's in great shape today. And it, get, it really gets treated with the respect it deserves. And uh, as soon as we finish with it, it goes back in the case and back on the wall. That summer at Boomerang, Duke Kahanamoku was at the height of his powers as an athlete and celebrity. He continued to win Olympic medals for another 20 years, became a Hollywood movie star, a surfing superstar, and eventually the sheriff of Honolulu. Isabel too became a celebrity in her own right. At the war's end, still a teenager, she went to Hawaii, then on to New York and Los Angeles. She eventually became a much in demand teacher of swimming and water ballet in San Francisco. And back in freshwater in her later years, she became the patron of women's surfing and helped nurture young champions. Isabel's story, or at least most of it, is held here in the local studies unit of the DY Library. Oh, thank you, Tina. There's boxes and boxes of this stuff, you know, beautiful old photographs and, and scrapbooks and newspaper clippings, uh, even, even her autograph book, uh, stuff that really documents uh, the early years uh, when, when she was living at Freshwater with her family and the beach was her principal interest. 
What you won't find here in this collection, however, is how much her life was truly changed by her encounter that summer at Boomerang with Duke Kahanamoku. She freely admitted that she would never have thought of going to America if it hadn't been for meeting the Duke. And in later years in California, she did meet him uh, once or twice. And uh, later on, many, many years later in Australia, they were reunited. Um, and although you know, they, they didn't see a lot of each other in, in ensuing years, uh, she lived with the vision of Duke Kahanamoku from 1914, 15 for the rest of her very long life. Isabel never married, not for lack of offers, she told an interviewer quite late in her life. She said that there were three loves of her life and if they could have all been combined into the one man, she probably would have married him. I think we can safely assume that, that one of those, those three men was Duke Kahanamoku.